healing is knowing that like I have this part of my story, but it's not my entire story. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about mental health. So we cover toxic positivity, how to process emotions, heal from trauma, deal with dysfunctional families, build resilience to adverse experiences, and more. Our guest today is Whitney Goodman. Whitney Goodman is the radically honest psychotherapist behind the popular Instagram account, Sit With Wit, author and owner of the Collaborative Counseling Center, a virtual therapy practice practice in Florida. Whitney's debut book, Toxic Positivity, Keeping It Real in a World Obsessed with Being Happy, shows readers how to shift the goal from being happy to being authentic in order to live fully. A millennial on a quest to make mental health information accessible and easy to understand, Whitney helps people who want to improve their relationships and emotional wellness. Whitney has her own column in Psychology Today and has been featured in dozens of domestic and international publications, including the New York Times, Teen Vogue, New York Magazine, and Good Morning America. Hello, Whitney. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you start by telling us um, how, how would you describe your approach to therapy? So I tend to have a very direct approach, I think. I, I like to really like get into what's going on. Um, I'm very family systems oriented. So looking at how your past, especially your family relationships, are shaping your current behavior is my main approach. Okay. And what about therapy? Like, I guess, what got you inspired to go into it in the first place? I have always loved hearing people's stories and trying to understand, like, why they do what they do, why they are the way that they are. And I feel very fortunate that I got into this, like, straight out of college. I went to graduate school. So it's really been my only career. Um, and I've loved like every second of it. it. It never gets boring and it's, it's always super interesting. What part about your work lights you up the most? I think being able to help people like untangle things that they're confused about. So helping someone like who comes in and says, oh, I'm doing this and I don't understand why. And we can really like walk the story all the way back to figure out how that narrative got started. It's such a cool thing to watch people have that light bulb moment. And then once they understand, they're like, oh, wow, now I know how this happened. And then I can start changing it. Oh, I see. Amazing. So do you believe that everything essentially comes from like your family background or like, I guess, do you have like, what are your beliefs? I think a lot of what we experience in adulthood like is influenced by childhood, especially those early years that we don't even really remember as much or maybe understand. And that's why it can be helpful to go back as an adult and kind of look at like, oh, this is what was happening to me. Now, of course, there are things that are just part of us, regardless of, of what we experience in our families or outside of that, like our personality, our temperament, those things can be pretty fixed. And then it's going to just be influenced by our family. So I feel like I, I think the family is a big part of it, but there are of course other things that are influenced outside of that. Yeah. And I'm curious, do you know, like how early are we influenced? Is it literally from the moment we're a baby? Well, even when we're like not conscious? Absolutely. So <laughs> the way that, and, and I, I like to preface this by saying that you can make up for all of these things. Like you can change them, you can re-influence things. So if something happened to you or to your child when they're really little, don't feel like you're doomed. We also know that parents are really, really only need to be attuned to their kids. I think it's like, it's either 20 or 30% of the time to have a good influence. So things have to be pretty bad to be mm. irreparable, but okay. we do start feeling influences, even like just from the second we enter the world. And a lot of that is about the stories we're told about those times too. Like I think most right. people know there's a story around their birth, what it was like after they were born. Like you hear these messages and they become part of who you are. 
Yeah. I think it's so interesting how a lot of it is not necessarily the reality of what happened, but the story that you believe about what happened, right? Um, and everyone, it, their perception is different. So how do you typically walk someone through, you know, changing their story? Well, first, I want to know how they see themselves, what they believe to be true about that story. I like to know who told them that story, where they got those messages from. A lot of times, the most negative things that we believe about ourselves were actually told to us by someone else or something that we interpreted from something someone else said. And so I really like to get at the root of like, whose voice is that? Is that really your voice? And then we can look at things from an outsider perspective. Sometimes when I hear things, I hear them so differently from the person because I don't have that whole narrative and that experience. And I can, it's easier for me to step out of it. And so from there, we would start to uncover like what parts of this story are serving you and in what way. Sometimes it's helping us grow. Sometimes it's keeping us stuck. And there's always new ways to write a story or to understand it from a different point of view. Wow. There are some people who are really stuck in their stories that they don't even believe it's something you can change, right? I think one angle to look at it is like, like that's a fact. And why would you try to, some people think it's like lying to yourself, like rewriting your story is like pretending. So, so what's your response to that? I'm a big believer in something called radical acceptance, which is like a very um, honest way of looking at life, of looking like, okay, this is what's good and this is what's bad. And it's probably a, somewhere in between is reality. And I would never encourage someone to lie to themselves, especially in a positive way about like, everything's mm. fine, there's right. no issues. But we also know that m multiple people can look at the same fact pattern in very different ways and they can all be right and it can all have some truth to it. So it's not about rewriting the facts necessarily, but just finding a different way to look at them and understand them. Mm, so interesting. Um, so this kind of leads me into, I want you to talk about your book, Toxic Positivity. So, so what is toxic positivity and what is it not? Toxic positivity is the unrelenting pressure to be happy and positive all the time, no matter what the circumstances are. And this is something that we, like a pressure we can put on ourselves and others in moments when they're struggling. I always like to clarify that optimism is not toxic positivity. Being happy, having a positive outlook is not toxic positivity. Toxic positivity is like when you take positivity way too far and it becomes dismissive, it denies someone's experience. Right. So it's not about denying someone's experience. Like you mentioned radical acceptance, like you have to see the reality for what it is, but it's also okay to be optimistic. I think some people kind of get um, blurred with those lines. I know I, I kind of do because I, I tend to be more of a positive person. And then sometimes I'm like, is this toxic positivity? <laughs> How do you kind of clarify that further? Yeah, it's funny because I wrote this book, but I consider myself to be a pretty optimistic person. So optimism is just the belief that things can improve, they can change, they can get better. It's a really important quality to have. But in order to have true optimism, I think we also have to understand like where things went wrong and what could be different and what could be better. Otherwise, you're giving yourself this false idea that things are just going to improve no matter what. And sometimes that blocks you from seeing opportunities, challenges, things that you could do differently. And it actually stops you from getting what you want or from things getting better. So true optimism, I think, is in line with that radical acceptance that we talked about, where people are able to see like, this is what is good. This is what could get better. And this is what's hard right now. Hi, my loves. I just want to take a quick break to let you know about the new Dream Life Club, our new membership program featuring monthly live events and workshops for personal growth and wellness, goals, accountability, masterminds, and community, a powerful resource for your dream life journey. The Dream Life Club is a space to connect, learn, and grow together and find more support and empowerment as you go after the life you want. If you've been searching for a positive, supportive community or a way to commit more consistently 
can lead to your personal growth and healing journey, this is for you. Learn more and join now at lavendaire.com slash DLC. That's lavendaire.com slash DLC. I'm so excited to have you. I guess it's being more realistic and not being afraid to look at what's not working and what's not good in a situation. I guess, what is your take on, like, say, affirmations when people try to, you know, develop a more positive mind? Where is the line? It's so crazy because I think affirmations, positive affirmations are part of, like, every school of thought when it comes to self-improvement, right? Like, everyone's going to tell you, oh, you need to do positive affirmations. That when I started actually getting into the research, I was shocked on how ineffective positive affirmations can be on people who actually need them. So if you're someone that is struggling with low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, being overly positive actually has a negative impact because you don't believe it. It doesn't come true. And it's this feeling of lying to yourself. If you are, if you have a lot of self-doubt and you're telling yourself, I'm the best, I'm the most confident, you don't actually believe that it's not going to work. So positive Mm -hmm. affirmations like that can be helpful for people who already have a pretty stable sense of self, relatively high self-esteem, and they don't really need positive affirmations as much as the people who are struggling. Yeah. The way I see it is it's like if the gap is too wide, like if you absolutely can't believe it, then it's not working. You should start, I don't know, you have to start where you are, right? You're absolutely right. And it needs to feel... It needs to feel believable and possible. So I always like encourage people exactly what you just said to like, how can you go up like 10% from where you are now? That if you say like, I hate my body. Okay. Saying I love my body, I'm beautiful in the mirror every day is probably not going to feel realistic to you. So how can you get to the point of just like, I can show myself respect or I can criticize myself less. And like, just try to move away a little bit from that. Oh yeah, that's that definitely makes more sense. <laughs> it's more realistic and it's more doable because it's hard to like jump from like black to white. Like it's, you, you need to take the baby steps along the way. Okay, so can you share some, I guess, toxic positivity phrases that people typically use and what to say instead? Yeah, so some of the big offenders are everything happens for a reason, just smile, just choose joy, choose happiness. Um, Any of these statements that are really simple solutions for complicated problems. So if you're ever thinking like, I can solve this person's depression, infertility, grief, whatever, I'm going to turn it around with this one simple statement, that's probably toxic positivity. (laughs) Because if we could do that, we'd have a lot less depressed people walking around. So the the things to say instead, I think is always starting from a place of like, do I really understand what's going on with this person? And if they've just told you like two minutes of what they're dealing with, you probably don't know enough to make a recommendation yet. So that's when I would start with just like validation of that sounds hard. I get why you would be struggling with that. I'm here for you. Um, Do you want advice or do you just want to vent? And really trying to just be in the space with that person instead of trying to fix it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Because I think a lot of people, they naturally, I I think it's just naturally ingrained. For example, when I was young, like people just tell you, oh, stop crying. Don't cry. Don't cry. Instead of like giving you space to express your emotions and validate how you feel. Absolutely. They just want you to be happy. Yeah, exactly. Again. Just a smile, just be happy. But it, I guess as a culture, it's something that it, it's become a habit to, to say things like that. It's kind of like an easy response. But yeah, it's good to be aware that it's not helpful and we can start shifting. Okay. So you talk about uh, the keys to living a full life are authenticity and emotional expression. Uh, what do you mean by that? So when I talk about authenticity, I mean living in alignment with your values, who you are, and what is important to you. This doesn't mean that you're going to be able to be like your quote unquote full self all the time. Like, of course, there's going to be different versions of you when you're at work, when you're with your parents, when you're with your friends. 
but being able to feel like I can be accepted for who I am and I'm living in alignment with what is important to me. Okay. And then emotional expression. What do you mean by that? So emotional expression, I feel like now we've taken this also to an extreme where people are like, I should listen to every feeling and feel every feeling. And when I talk about emotional expression, I'm talking about like feeling comfortable, feeling a wide variety of emotions, but also knowing when, where, and with whom you can safely express those emotions. So like if I was feeling really sad and overwhelmed right now, this podcast might not be the best time for me to start sharing that, right? This is like a work thing. I'm here in another capacity, but I might know that I have a friend or a family member that I can talk to after this. So allowing yourself to express and feel the full range of emotions, like within the confines of what is appropriate and suitable for your own life, your culture, all of that. Yeah. I think that's still something we're kind of learning as a society is I, I, cause I'm all about expressing your emotions too, but it's, it, you know, it could look like really crazy cause you can express it everywhere. Sometimes like in the moment you just want to let it out, but it's actually like, you're going to hurt others. You're going to affect others if you, if you do that all the time. So safe spaces to express. Yes. 100%. Okay. Give us an example using your life. Like how do you ensure you're showing up authentically in the world? So I try to do things that are in line with my values. So some values for me would be like independence, flexibility, um, authenticity would be a value of mine. So being able to show up in a way that is meaningful for me means not saying yes to opportunities that I don't actually want to do or that feel wrong to me, unless it's something I have to do for another reason. So like family could be a value to me and maybe I don't feel like driving someone to the airport, but family is important to me. So I'm going to do that thing. And really thinking about like, how can I wake up in the morning and know that my schedule and where I'm spending my time is in line with what is important to me. I think when you're able to do that, you feel like yourself and you feel like you're doing a good job in the world and you're able to look at your day and be like, all right, like 75 to 80% of this feels good or easy or comes naturally to me. Right. It's like putting, like you're prioritizing your values and putting what you would like to do first. Because if you, if you don't live that way, you're going to eventually feel resentful if you're like doing too much for other people and, and so on. For sure. And I think figuring out like also what's good for you in the long run might not always feel good in the short term. And that's where values can really come in. Is like, I I might really value health and maybe I don't want to exercise or I don't want to do this thing, but to get my value, I need to do that. Right. Okay. On that note, I I know like something that's really big for mental health is like exercise, moving your body. Like, why don't you let's talk about the basics of like emotional wellness and what you recommend everyone do. And then we'll talk about how to get ourselves to do it because we don't always feel like doing these things. For sure. Yeah. So I think like when we talk about what's going to make you feel good, you have to come from your own perspective of like, what do I have access to? What do I need? And what helps me? So for me personally, movement is like, essential to helping me feel good. Um, but that doesn't have to be like you go to like Barry's boot camp. Like you could just go on a walk or even like pacing when you're on the phone in your house, stretching, finding some way to get movement into your day. And I think that's going to look different for everybody, especially if you're a parent or you're chronically ill or you're disabled. Like don't try to attain this type of movement that you see like on Instagram that you think you should be doing. It doesn't have to be a class or something like that. The other part is definitely getting outside. There's so much research on this that just having a little bit of sunlight being in the outdoors, even if if all you do is go like sit on your balcony, a porch, whatever can be super helpful. Um, The other thing I think people forget about is like drinking water and eating food. A lot of the time when we think like, oh my gosh, I'm doomed and anxious. I ask people like, what are you eating? Like, 
did you drink water today or did you only drink coffee? (laughs) And you'd be surprised like how often that can be the solution like to your problems. And and of course, not getting fixated on everything you're eating and, and that can go in the wrong direction too. But just like those basics are so important. And then the last piece of course is relationships. So are the people in your life taking more from you than they're giving? Do you feel supported? Do you have close people in your life? That is a big indicator of health. Okay. Yeah. Those are all so good. Um, So let's talk a little bit about how do you work with people if they're working to like change their lifestyle or habits, say like they're not used to movement and they know it's good for them, but they can't. So, So how do you work with them through that? So anybody that's thinking about making this change in their life, I would want them to focus on one of those areas at first that I mentioned. Do not try to tackle all of them at once. And so if we're going to focus on movement and you're somebody that isn't doing any movement, let's say you haven't done anything in 10 years, you want to start so small that it almost seems insignificant. Like the longer it's been since you've done something, the smaller you need to start. So it could be like, I am going to challenge myself to take a five minute walk once a week. Mm-hmm. And once you're able to consistently master that, like it's been several weeks, you're checking that off your list. Okay. Now I'm going to either bump it up to a 10 minute walk, or I'm going to do five minute walk, two five minute walks a week and really building confidence. I see a lot of people be like, I'm going to work out five days a week and they haven't worked out in years. And that is just way too difficult. You're going to fail and then you're going to quit because it's just unsustainable. Yeah. So back to that, like, uh, the idea that you can't have the gap be too big between like reality and the goal. (laughs) You need to guide yourself through it. Exactly. Okay. So next I want to ask you about, I guess, emotional wellness in general. Like what does it look like to be emotionally well? How do we take care of our emotional self? The people who are the healthiest emotionally to me as a therapist are people who are able to feel a wide spectrum of emotions and move in and out of those feelings with ease. So not getting so stuck in certain feelings. Like if you're somebody that throughout the day, if you get annoyed at work, it's very hard for you to shake that or move out of it. That would be a sign to me that you don't have a lot of emotional flexibility which is a really big sign of emotional wellness. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think if you were not taught that as a child, most of us were not. Um, You might've even seen your parents, like they were either happy or angry. Like I hear that from so many people. And so you don't have a skill set. You need to learn that in adulthood if you didn't learn it as a kid. We're not born knowing this. And that requires really practicing skills to help yourself move in and out of those feelings. I see. So basically you're saying like in the, like originally it's not bad to like get angry. It's not bad to have these emotions, but you need to learn how to like come in and out of them easier. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And and then learning to modulate your behavior around that feeling. So getting angry is not bad. Punching somebody when you get angry (laughs) can be bad. So it's like, how can I create space to allow myself to feel the feeling to such a degree that it doesn't overwhelm me where I do something that has a negative Mm -hmm. consequence. Right. So how do you kind of coach people to build these skills? How does it work? The first step is really just helping people understand like the wide variety of feelings that they can experience in a day. Most of the people I work with start off with a very limited feelings vocabulary, like I just mentioned. So it'll be like happy, sad, angry. And we're trying to work on like, how can we make that a lot more granular? Um, When you look at research on emotions, there's quite a significant amount of data that the more we're able to label our emotions and understand them and label them even in smaller amounts, the less scary those feelings feel and they feel known to us, then we know how to do something with them. So I want to help people know like, this is what anger feels like in my body and I can label it as anger. This is sadness. This is when I feel annoyed. And from there, once you know what you're feeling, we can start to work on actual like coping skills and mechanisms to help you sit with that feeling and move through it. Okay. So let's talk about those. Like, how do you move through these emotions? 
So the first thing is going to be building up tolerance for actually like what that feeling feels like. And this is when I would recommend therapy just because you're going to have that hour space in your week to like practice feeling feelings with someone and it not be risky at all because you're not trying to do it at work or with a friend. Like it's just like a safe space to do that. And you're going to almost be doing like exposure therapy in a way of like, okay, I'm feeling angry. I can sit with this. I can survive it. I can get through it. And you can imagine your emotions like going up peaking. And then once they reach that peak, starting to feel them fall. Mm. And the more experience that you get of like being able to feel that rise and fall, you feel more skilled and experienced knowing that like emotions don't last forever they pass and I can handle them when they come. Mm, and then you don't fight them as much. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, it just, it will come and then it will go. Exactly. Exactly. Versus somebody who like, let's say you're somebody that drinks when you're angry. What you're probably doing is like, as you feel that feeling rising, you don't trust that it's going to end or that you're going to know what you do with it. So you, you drink so that you can make it go away. And, and make that feeling fall and it gives you relief. And then you get caught in this cycle of like, that's what I have to do to get rid of the feeling. Wow. I, I see. So you're essentially saying most people, like they're afraid to feel their feelings all the way. So yeah, we all know people suppress their feelings, which is unhealthy. Um, and then another thing is like, yeah, because some people, once they're in the emotion, they feel like they're living it and they don't know when it it ends. Like it, it can go wild. Right. So we have to learn to be like the observer of the emotion. Like the more you observe it rise and fall, the more you're like, Oh, it's, it'll pass. Exactly. And then it becomes something that isn't all of you. It's just a part of you. So I am not, when we say like, I am angry, it's like, Oh my gosh, everything about me is anger. There is nothing else to me, but anger. That's overwhelming. Then if you say, I feel angry or X, you know, led to me feeling angry. You can externalize it some. Would you consider this like controlling your emotions or is it not? No, I think when we talk about controlling our emotions, I feel like that now gets like a bad rap, almost like you're talking about suppressing them. And that's not what this is. This is more just like, I trust myself to feel big feelings and to know what I need when I'm feeling them. And so that might mean like, when I start to feel this, I need to go on a walk. I need to get some space. Um, I need to talk to someone. And so you're trying to pair the behavior that isn't going to help you squash the feeling necessarily, but it's going to just help you ride that wave and come Mm, down. Yeah. Okay. Riding the wave. I love that. That's so helpful. Um, Okay. And then as you've been like guiding people through learning to ride their emotions, I guess, what is the biggest, uh, I guess, obstacle (laughs) that people face? And then how do you guide them through that? I think what we talked about earlier is that some people are really scared of certain emotions or especially related back to the family. They identify certain feelings with certain people in their life that they don't want to be like. Um, If you had a parent that would get very angry You might be someone that's like, I don't want to feel anger. I don't want to associate with anger. I suppress every amount of anger. And so it can be hard to help people understand that we all feel these emotions. There is no one that is exempt from that. It's more just like, how are you going to deal with them and show them? And thinking about how it wasn't the anger that was bad. It was how that person was dealing with their anger that hurt you. Um, that's definitely a challenge. And then people also feeling very resistant, like I'm going to get stuck in this feeling if I allow myself to feel it. And so mm-hmm. really helping people through that can be difficult. Right. Because you have to be able to grow your trust that, oh, I trust that I can get over this feeling, which I think a lot of people who've never felt their feelings, they they don't know that that they can get over it. Right. For sure. Or there's this idea of like, I should be happy and okay all the time. Like that's that toxic positivity of like, I should be healed and happy and Zen. And like, that's never going to happen because you're a human being. You just want to get yourself less reactive. Right, right. 
Okay, so now I do want to move on to talking about healing from trauma. I know it's a very big topic and it like it's almost like I don't know where to start, but I mean, for I know there's a lot of listeners who of all ages, right? But there's a lot of people who can't can't necessarily afford therapy. So how would you advise people like how to heal from trauma if they can't afford therapy? If you can't afford therapy, I think going back to what we just talked about with like how feelings manifest in the body is really important. Um, Trauma tends to be stored on a physical level and can be very challenging to heal when you're just intellectualizing it. So even doing movement can be really helpful with that, whether it's like yoga, stretching, massage, like ways to help yourself release crying can be really, really helpful talking to people about your experiences, especially people that have gone through what you've been through. There's a lot of support groups, things like that, that can be free in your area too for survivors that I would recommend. Okay. Are there any things that you advise people not to do like around this topic? I think there are a lot of people out there right now that are trying to unfortunately like profit off of the rise in like trauma discourse And so there are a lot of people promising some really big things that I don't think are true. Uh, I especially see this online of like, cure your trauma in four weeks with like this course or whatever. And I just like, that's just not going to work. Um, It could help you in some way. But the biggest thing that you need to create in your life if you want to heal from trauma is you need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that starts with, is my home safe? Do I have resources? Do I feel financially secure? Do I have a safe food source? Like these are all so much more important than like going out and buying something. And I would say that to anyone who is looking to even to go to therapy, like you need to feel safe. In terms of like healing through trauma, because I know healing through trauma is not something that it's like you, you heal once and you're done, right? So Is there a point where you're absolutely healed or do you think it's just something that is a never ending journey in someone's life? The people that I have seen like come out on the other side of really like adverse outcomes, I think they still know what happened to them. It's a part of their story. Um, It's not something that ever goes away in the same way that our good memories are also part of us. But you find that people can become much less reactive, much less triggered. And that just becomes a part of them. It's not their entire story where someone who has PTSD, who's really struggling, that can become completely debilitating. It can take over every aspect of your life to a degree that you can't really function. And so I think healing is knowing that like, I have this part of my story, but it's not my entire story. Mm -hmm. I see. It's being able to like accept it and like not having that story or that trauma, like control your entire life. Right. Especially without your consent. Like if you choose to do something with that story, like work to help other people, whatever it is, that's different. I think than something taking over your life and it not being a choice. I see. Yeah. I guess that's the the, if you're in a place where it's absolutely like controlling, like the goal is just to like be able to feel like you have a little more control over your life. You can't erase it. You can't erase the trauma, but at least you can like function and it begin to enjoy your life a little better. Right. Mm-hmm. I see. Um, something that you talk about that I, I relate to is like adults who didn't get to be kids and like reparenting yeah. yourself as an adult. Um, can you talk about that? Cause I feel like a lot of people can relate to that. So what, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, just tell us about it. Yeah. So there's a concept known as a parentification that happens to kids when they are put into adult roles that are not developmentally appropriate. And we see this happen across the spectrum. There are kids who grew up who were abandoned by their parents and had to raise their siblings and really take on roles. And then you also see on the other end of the spectrum, I think kids who maybe served as like a therapist for their parents, or they were told information that wasn't appropriate for a kid. And what we ultimately find with these kids is that they grow up too fast. They become kids that are like little adults, maybe called mature for their age, so responsible. And there's a lot of good qualities that can come from this. 
you might be really responsible, uh, really ambitious, task oriented. It's not all bad. But the other side is that sometimes you miss out on a lot of key developmental milestones in childhood and things like play, being carefree, being relaxed. And it can be very hard for those kids as adults to engage in those parts of their personality. Right. So what would be like the first steps to, to deal with that? If you are, if you can relate to that. I think first really getting clear on like, what do you like about yourself now that may have been a result of those things? So you might be really driven, really focused, ambitious. Like these are all things that you might like and, and want to celebrate about yourself. And then looking at how was I negatively impacted by this? Where do I struggle? And that's when you can get clear on what do I need more of in my life? For a lot of parentified kids, it might be that they need more flexibility, more freedom, more play, more lightheartedness. And so that can involve like picking up a hobby, doing something just for fun, trying to just rest. Like some, some parentified kids have a lot of trouble even just like sitting down and watching TV, not taking care of everybody mm-hmm. in their life. Or I see a lot of adults now even saying like, you know what? I don't want to have children because I already raised my siblings or I already took care of my parents and allowing yourself to say like, that's okay if I don't want that life experience. Right. Right. Essentially it's, there's both like, like you can accept that there were good and bad that came out of that situation. What about like people who feel like bitter towards their parents or like, how do you heal? How do you, you know, whether the parent is in your life or not, what are the things you help people through? It's normal to feel bitter about that, especially if you were put into situations that were really inappropriate or outside of your abilities as a kid. And it can be even more challenging when your parent doesn't recognize that. So the the first step I would say is like, bring this up with your parents if you can, and, and at least give it an attempt and see how they respond if you have an abusive parent or someone like that, I would, of course, only do this with a mediator in the context of therapy. But otherwise, you know, even telling your parents, like, I was thinking about when I was growing up and like, this was pretty hard for me. There are going to be parents that are going to be dismissive and they might say, you know what? I was working so hard and you're lucky that you had a roof over your head. And in that case, you might say, you know what? My parents aren't ready to receive this information and I need to start healing this on my own. And so that's when I would go back to validating your perspective of like, I was a child. I was too young to handle the responsibilities that I was given. It was not my fault. And no child would have been able to handle or manage what I was being asked to manage because I just did not have the skills. I mean, what is your take on, do you have to talk to the parent or like, like versus like working with the person involved in your trauma versus working on it by yourself? Like whether it's like through forgiveness or anything like that, is there, is one way more preferred or healthier or is it just whatever works for you? I think it's personal preference and depends on the situation because If you have a parent who is completely unable to access any level of insight, they're emotionally immature, they're denying you, gaslighting you, like you're at some point going to have to say, I'm going to heal this on my own because I don't want to continue this trend. There are people though, who, when they go to their parents, their parents are open, maybe a little bit open. They need a little bit of time to come around. And so I recommend when possible to try to work with the parent. But if that's opening yourself up to more abuse, more disrespect, you of course have every right to say, this isn't healing for me. This is just more of the same. And now I'm going to start to go do this on my own. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And then on the topic of, you know, every family has their level of like maybe dysfunction, you can say. So how would you recommend people to like heal from and stop the patterns that say their parents or grandparents or whatever, like those, um, those bad habits, I would say. So a big trend that I'm seeing now is like a lot of people, you know, millennials, Gen Z are, are realizing, wow, my family was really dysfunctional. 
And a lot of that dysfunction appears when we compare what was normal in our parents' generation and maybe our our parents' culture, especially if you're a child of immigrants, anything like that, compared to what is normal for me now. And so I think when that happens, we have to look at like, what are the two worlds that are competing here? How can I try to understand what was happening then? And then how can I work on what do I want to do differently with the knowledge that I have now? Now, I'm not talking about forgiving abuse. Like abuse has always been bad, no matter when your parents were born or where they were born. Uh, But I think it's worth trying to understand sometimes how the dysfunction in your family has continued for this long and then what you'd like to change about it. Like it helps to be aware of like understanding why they were the way they were instead of just like dismissing it as, oh, they were dysfunctional and bad or whatever, right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you have to accept it or say it's okay or even forgive in any way. Like I don't think that's necessary for healing, but it can help give you context which gives you a starting point for you changing what your family is going to look like and what your life is going to look like. One of the most dangerous um, statements I think in a family is when people say, well, this is just the way we are. This is the way we've always done things. That's just how your grandmother is, you know, as a way to excuse behavior. When instead we can go a level below and say, well, why are we this way? You know, what happened throughout the course of our family that has caused us to end up like this, for better or worse? Okay. And I also want to ask you about any tips you have for setting boundaries, especially, you know, some people, they have like family members where the best thing you can do is like set a boundary. (laughs) So so what are your tips on that? Because it's hard when this person is in your life or maybe you live with them. It's very hard. So first thing is get clear on what exactly the issue is. Where do you need the boundary? What would you like to see change? And then coming back to, if I can't make this person change, what is a boundary that I can implement that I can enforce? So the example I like to use is like, let's say you have someone in your family that drinks and you don't want to be around them when you're drinking. Instead of telling them, you can't drink around me, you would say, I am not going to be around you when you drink. And if that person drinks, you're going to choose to leave. You're not going to be around them, but really focusing on like, what is my behavior that I can control in all of this? And what can I manage if this person never changes anything about themselves? Because a lot of times they don't. (laughs) Right, right. Ultimately, the only thing you can control is what you do. So it's like reframing it, not trying to like change them or like argue with them to change, but like, how can I, what can I do, right? To protect myself. Exactly. Okay. Let's talk more about, I guess, mental health for the collective. Cause I think more and more since, I'm not sure if it's always been this bad, but I guess since COVID, like mental health is such a, a crisis. So what would you say, like, how can we nurture better mental health for our younger generations? I really think it starts with just like having more realistic expectations for our lives. I feel like we've entered this era where everyone wants to be perfect in Mm -hmm. so many arenas and we're comparing ourselves to like somebody who's an expert in something and expecting ourselves to also be an expert there. It also, I think, comes down to like people having the time and resources to take care of themselves. And that's a really loaded topic. But I believe that good mental health really starts with sleep. Uh, People not having to work 100 hours in order to sustain themselves. And then also looking at relationships. Like if you really care about mental health, how can you be kind and supportive to the people in your life and not do things that could tear people down or make their life worse. Right. Give us more insight on like how to shift our, like, you know, if say you want to shift your mindset or shift your, how you communicate in relationships, like how do we begin to do these things? I think going back to those little changes of like getting a clear idea of what do I want my relationships to look like? How do I want to show up? 
in my friendships, in my family relationships, and getting so clear on like, what does that look like? Does that look like us spending more time together, talking more, me sending them text messages, um, trying to be less critical of people, trying to like gossip less, whatever it is. But I think getting into this mindset of like, I have the power to create the kind of relationships that I want to have with people. And that all starts with how I choose to show up. Yeah. So it, it takes like the awareness at the and the intention. Cause I think people just go about their relationships and lives without thinking about it. Yeah. That's a big shift that's happening. I think with family relationships is it used to just be your family and family just stays together no matter what. That's a cultural belief across so many cultures. And now people are saying, wait, I don't want to be around people that treat me badly. <laughs> and so this big shift is happening. I see. Okay. And then what about, I guess, what advice do you have for people who know someone in their life struggling with mental health? What are the ways you can help them? I believe that people who are struggling with their mental health, like they want people to notice, even if they're pushing you away. So the best thing you can do is extend a hand to that person with no repercussions if they choose not to accept what you're giving. So can you send them a text with no requirement that they respond? Can you check in on them without any judgment, criticism, or implication of like, wow, they're not grateful for my help? Mm -hmm. How can you just like be there just to be there, not for right. any nope. other benefit to you? Not yeah. expecting anything in return because that adds to it. <laughs> that makes it worse sometimes. For right? sure. For sure. Especially when someone is feeling really down, the last thing they need is like, now I need to repay you mm -hmm. in this moment for being there for me. Right. Okay. That's good. What about, <laughs> I mean, I have another question that I'm, I've always been curious about also about trauma is like, do you believe that it's inevitable that everybody experiences trauma? Like, is it a necessary part of the human experience or I don't know, what's your take on that? Yeah. I think everybody in life experiences pain, distress, grief. I don't think all those experiences will be traumatic. Um, trauma is really about your your body's ability to cope, your mind's ability to cope being like overridden with stress. And so most people who experience adverse life events will not be traumatized on the other side. They will have memories and possibly distress and difficulties related to that event, but they, they might not go on to experience long-term like pathology as a result. Okay, maybe trauma is too strong of a word then. Because I just think of, like, the way I see it is, like, even if you had, even if your parents did their best, <laughs> even if everything might have been pretty good, even something as small as, like, this kid didn't give you the candy that you earned, or, you know, like, something really small could cause a level of, like, ooh, like a shift in your brain that changes you, it changes the way you think <laughs> and the way you are for the rest of your life. So. Like I considered that like a level of trauma. Like people, for example, if you're scared of spiders because a spider, someone's, a, a cousin dangled one in front of your face, like things like that. It could be really silly and really small, but it still leaves an impact, right? Right. So that to me would be more like something that was an experience that altered your worldview. Like it could have been extremely stressful to your young self, which for sure. led for sure. to your personality. Absolutely. And that's, that's life, right? We're constantly mm -hmm. being shaped by our experiences, by the people we come in contact with. And that's what forms who we are right. for better or worse. And I don't know that I would consider those experiences to be traumatic. I would consider them to be like shaping and impactful. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but that I think what you're getting at is like pain and suffering to some degree are they're inevitable parts of the human condition. And trauma to me sits outside of that. It's another mm -hmm. level of that suffering. It's like a debilitating level. That's where you call it trauma. Right, right. Where if you were, um, let's say, if you know your spider example, it's, it's not just that you're scared of spiders, but you cannot be around spiders without having a panic attack. You don't leave your house because there might be a spider. It's, it's really 
you've crossed the threshold of your capacity to cope with that experience. Right. Okay. Okay. So there's the line is like ability to cope and continue to live on. Right. But I do feel like a lot of people are like on the other side of that line where it gives them so much anxiety still, but they can obviously function, which I still feel like that's something that you need to heal. Or I guess, what's your belief on that? Yeah, I think that can also come back to like, what's the story around this event? What am I still holding on to? Um, what do I need to heal? And, and maybe what am I trying to learn from this experience? But those, those are more, I think, the stories that make us who we are. And those stories can be impactful, but not always traumatic. Is there a way that you, like, let's say you could like guide people through childhood, like, or, or like guide parents, right? Guide their kids. Is there a way that you can empower the kid to like overcome these experiences without leaving that big of an impact? For example, things like people forcing you to watch scary movies, so it traumatizes you. So, like, how, like things. I, I, mean, I just feel like things happen in your childhood to everybody that leave us some sort of impact that could give us stress or anxiety. It as an adult. So, is there a better way to guide these kids through their emotions? I mean, childhood is scary because you are defenseless and everything is new to you, right? So. The, the number one thing that I think adults reflect on when it comes to trauma in childhood is not necessarily the event that happened, but feeling alone and powerless and defenseless in that event. So if you have a child and they go through something difficult, and I'm talking something even big, like a parent dying or being in an accident, the best thing you can do is allow them to have that experience and be the guiding force, the steady guiding force through that of like, it's okay to be scared. That was scary. I'm here with you. I'm going to help you through this. And when that happens, that's when we see resilience develop instead of PTSD, because it's actually good for kids to have a moderate level of adverse experience. I'm not talking about abuse or trauma, but like watching a scary movie or uh, moving a lot or something like that can be mitigated by parental support and actually have a, a good outcome in a sense that the child now is able to deal with challenges. Right. So they just need to feel supported. Like they have someone guiding them through it. Right. They need resources. They right. need to feel safe. Again. And you also recommend, like, it's also important for them to like learn to express their feelings instead of like handle them by, think they have to handle it by themselves. Absolutely. Because they can't, they don't have the skills. And that's ultimately, I think what results in a lot of the anxiety about those experiences is you get locked in, like, I'm still unable to handle those feelings as an adult. Okay, Whitney, um, if you have one final message that you'd like to leave with the audience today, what would that be? Oh gosh. I think just telling yourself that taking care of yourself matters and that you're allowed to really put yourself first and, and take care of your mental health in a meaningful way. It's important. Amazing. Um, where can we find you online? So you can find me on Instagram, TikTok at sit with wit and all of there are main links to my book, toxic positivity. It's sold anywhere. Books are sold as well as my website. Thank you so much. This was such a like information packed, advice packed interview. <laughs> You're so like concise and succinct with your responses. It was, it was very good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's good feedback for me. 